please join me in welcoming Chip Kidd and Paul Scher. All right, um, I'm just going to uh, run through a bunch of uh, recent, recent work, uh, all book covers. Um, I, I mostly do book covers. One of the authors that I've worked with for years is Augustin Burroughs. He's known as the running with scissors guy. Um, which I did not design, but then we became friends after that book came out, and so I designed his uh, next book after that, which was called this. Now, this is his memoir of being um, a, a hotshot ad exec on Madison Avenue in his 20s and a raging alcoholic, which I know all sounds redundant, but um, <laughs> still, uh, this was a problem. So. His colleagues did an intervention. He very reluctantly uh, went into rehab because he didn't think he had a problem. So um, the, uh, the concept on uh, this cover is to have, how to make a typography look like it's in denial. This is the most low-tech solution uh, I could possibly do. This is setting the type up in Quark and printing it out on an Epson printer with water-soluble ink, taping it up on the wall, getting a bucket of water, and throwing it at it. This is a book that's out now. It's by David Kessler, uh, who was the former Surgeon General uh, of the United States, and he's, uh, he contacted me personally for uh, this book that was originally called Sugar, Salt, Fat which I just leaked at. I mean, that's the kind of title that any book designer you know, just wants to eat up, frankly. Uh, and then he changed it to the end of overeating, and my heart just sank, because how do you show the end of overeating? But I started to think about, all right, what, what's a sort of like thing that you can eat that's not good for you, but you could sort of kid yourself or talk yourself into the fact that it's good for you? And I decided on carrot cake. <laughs> That's good for you, it's made from carrots. <laughs> Delicious carrot cake. Really the idea is like put away the carrot cake and eat the carrots. When I give talks like this, especially in schools, I try to hammer this home to the kids that you know I've been doing this for 24 years and counting, hopefully. Uh, and to this day, um, I get things rejected all the time for various reasons. Now, Augustine's next book, which will be out in about a month, is his uh, humorous essays on Christmas with this wonderful title. At the same time, I started to get uh, emails, a blog from another photographer friend of mine named Thomas Allen, who I've worked with before, who started a blog called The 12 Tawdry Days of Christmas. And so what he did every day was he went into a Goodwill uh, in, in Wisconsin where he lived, and he, and he picked uh, one sort of horrible Christmas goo every day and posted them. And so, um, one of which happened to be this. Augustine, uh, I sent it to him first, which can be a dicey proposition, but, uh, but we're friends. And he said, you know, it's cute, but it's not scary enough. So I went back to, to Tom Allen, who was proceeding with his 12 tawdry days of Christmas, and found this um, <laughs> uh, Santa Claus uh, you know, candy holder, ceramic, and his, his uh, sack is hollow. And so we stuffed a few, he stuffed a few figurines in there to be mean. And I said, well, I think this is a nice start. But um, let's get even meaner and go to firearms. And uh, so he sent that to me. And I said, all right, I think um, this is really getting there. But now let's add a narrative and bring the little girl back. Um, <laughs> so this goes off to the publisher. And uh, a week goes by, and I hear nothing. And then another week goes by, and I hear nothing. Uh, when somebody likes something, they want, they're dying to tell you right away. And when you hear nothing, that means they either don't like it, or they don't like it and can't figure out how to tell you, or they don't like it and can't figure out how to tell, tell you and have assigned it to somebody else. So sure enough, week three, I get a phone call from the art director who says, um, we had a, you know, in the marketing meeting, they just think this is too mean. So of course there's been a communication gap between the author and the, the publisher. And, but then the art director also said, you know, we literally had a 10 minute discussion in the meeting about whether or not Santa Claus is showing the little girl his penis. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to start over. Now, so I start thinking about like other goofy things that people do on the holidays. And if you, you know, you go online, You'll, you'll see this all, all the time. Uh, there are rife with pictures of people and their pets and, and dressing them up to celebrate the various holidays. And this I like because it reminded me of Dr. Seuss. Uh, but for sheer sort of morbidity, um, 
you can't really beat that. I mean, he really looks like he's about to burst into tears. But um, even better, getting back to mean, uh, is this guy. Uh, <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, this just, this just seals the deal. And so I sent it off to the publisher, and one week goes by, and I hear nothing. Sure enough, by work week three, the art director called and said, you know what, thanks a lot, but we solved it in-house. Just bill us a kill fee. And so that was the end, and, and I don't know what they ended up with. So what? I'll be surprised along with everybody else. So my name is Paula Scher. Nice to meet you. I've been designing for 38 years. The way people think about me is different depending upon the, the point in time they encountered me. So I'm going to sort of take you through it from way back when to today. I had a great job at CBS Records um, where I was uh, art director, East Coast art director, producing about 150 album covers a year when I was 26 years old. And I began by doing things that were counter to what existed at the time, which was the Swiss International style. I worked with a lot of eclectic typography, which I loved. Mm -hmm. And I began applying it to all sorts of things. And they got some no notoriety and attention at their time. What was innovative about the work was at that particular point in time, people made big images on covers with illustrations and ph photographs. And type was secondary. And I sort of brought type to the foreground. This at the time, which when it was designed in 1979, was considered extremely radical. As a matter, of, a matter of fact, I entered it in a lot of shows, and I got rejected from every show until about three years later. And I did things any way I could. Um, I did this cover for the American Institute of Graphic Design's annual in 1989, and I painted it by hand and wrote sort of a narrative of what design was in America. And I, what I did is I. I listed every single state in the United States and the percentage of people who used Helvetica. So this whole series was Bring in the Noise, Bring in the Funk, which happened. There were a series of posters and images that happened from 95 to 98. And uh, we, the, the first one that I showed you actually started out downtown when the, when the play opened at the public. And then gradually it moved uptown. This was for Broadway. And then there were a series of posters all over New York City. The public theater work, People assumed, because I put type up in the lobby, that I actually understood architecture. And I started to get hired to do environmental graphics by real architects. And I can't figure this out, because I still, to this day, am really bad at reading an architecture plan. But I'm, for some reason, I started to understand what type would look like in space. And then I was hired to do another uh, performing arts school, which was this disgusting building in um, uh, the Lucent Technology gave to the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, and they only had $100,000 for a budget to fix it, so I covered it with typography. I did it in more expensive materials uptown at Symphony Space. This is uh, uh, Jim Polshek's renovation, another building that's sort of lathered with type. By the time I finished this, it had become another popular style, and all kinds of graphic designers began doing signage this way. It really didn't exist that much before I did it, but then I found myself competing with people who did it better on, with bigger budgets and for more expensive materials. And probably the most upscale version of my sort of out-of-scale typography was for Bloomberg's headquarters, which were these jar giant lucite letters that ran floor to ceiling. And, and I do uh, lots and lots of cultural identities. And my big problem with these identities is that I do them and they uh, are taken over in-house and the politics sort of override them and they get uh, virtually trashed. So what I've been concentrating on lately is actually what I would call management consultancy, where I get inside the corporation and try to restructure how the art department's reporting structure to make sure that people can actually do their job properly, but it gets more power for the art director so that the, uh, the designs can be carried out better. And that's about 38 years.